พุทธสาบะควะทุวะระหะทุสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบะควะทุอะระหะทุสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบะควะทุอะระหะทุสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะบุทังธรรมังทั้งขังธรรมสามิสิ่งสารุกีอ offered the d o n o r this this up this morning to the sangha is in memory of her mother and her mother-in-law and sister Upala. It's a significant uh, subject on death because uh, this is a subject that is very important in the uh, uh, in the religious life. And sometimes people don't realize the connection of death with uh, the immortal or ultimate. Death is a uh, sometimes seen in. I mean, one you know, politely ignores the subject or or is frightened of it. Uh, it's it's frightening. Uh, it's, it can be terrifying. Represents the, you know, something that we're all going to experience. We all are going to die. So, and especially when people like our parents die, then that that uh, is a is a, it's a people that die that we are close to our our loved ones, parents, grandparents, and uh, people we know. Not to mention people we don't know. The this. Uh, Perception of death can be very disturbing. There's a t- noise and confusion. You don't expect to, you know, to, to kind of make it uh, nicer. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in terms of uh, making it more kind of sentimental, and like when my mother died, then. The priest was a well. Now she's happier up in heaven with the Lord, and made it all sound very nice. And uh, you know, one was one wasn't uh, begrudging her that experience, but it wasn't really dealing with. I mean, it was it was just a, a kind of uh, sentiment um, that the priest was spewing forth. He didn't know what happened to my mother. And they weren't investigating the subject of death. They were just trying to get the funeral over with, it without too much uh, emotion or morbidity or or anything other than just trying to to get through it, pacify people. Where Buddhist funerals are much more realistic and practical, uh, because death is a subject that. That is uh, very important to to Buddhism, to the Buddhist teaching. o n e the reflection we chanted this morning of "I am of the nature to die, I am of the nature to age, I am of the nature to sicken." And he's bringing into this is mindful reflection. This is bringing into our consciousness the way it is. This isn't a kind of clinging to morbid things and. And wallowing in in a negativity, it's mindfulness is our ability to to bring into our consciousness the way things are. Like to be mindful means you're saying yes, the bell is here, the clock is here. You're aware of you're bringing into your mind the way it is, you're, how you're feeling. You're aware of how you're feeling. If you're feeling sick at your stomach, or you're feeling upset, or you're feeling tired, or you're feeling uh, happy, or whatever. Mindfulness is 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 it bringing is it acknowledging that noting it. It's bringing the, the the moment into into consciousness, the way it is, because so much of our life is spent in the realm that is not mindful at all. It's all kind of worried or or obsessed with this or angry about that or or trying to you know plan the future or. 
or live in a, in a fantasy world, a totally kind of false and deluded uh, world that many people, you know, choose to live in. But mindfulness, notice how in Buddhist meditation, mindfulness is called the path to the deathless. Apamado Amatapadang is one of my most commonly quoted uh, phrases from the Dhammapada. And the mindfulness is the path to the deathless. So in we're developing mindfulness about the way things are, the posture of the body, the breathing of the body. These are the ordinary things that that are going on now. So you're, you're grounding yourself in the present when you're going to your breath, to the posture, to the body, to the mood you're in, to the, the mental state you're in. Not, not, a, not a, an analysis of it, it's merely a, a recognition. Do, do you feel bright and happy or do you feel sad or do you feel angry or do you feel uh, uncertain, insecure, do you, whatever. Uh, maybe there's no word to describe how you're actually feeling, but at least you can be aware of it as a feeling. The mood uh, of the moment is this way. Or the feeling of the body, whether you're feeling uh, good, or strong and vigorous, or sickly, or whatever. Or, or whatever, it's just, just to bring into your mind the way it is. So death is, in, in our, is something that's going to happen to us. We know this. And so they, instead of waiting till the body dies to find out what it's all about, uh, the Buddha uh, uses this uh, subject of death by by bringing by say developing awareness around impermanence, the impermanent state of of the conditioned realm. So in a in a Buddhist funeral service. These are the chants they, they usually do. In Thailand, anyway, when, when anybody dies, they immediately call the monks and they go and, they, they, we, and we chant, Anicca Vada Sankara Ubatawa Yatamino Bacitawa Niruchanti De Sangu Basamo Sukho. And it translates as conditions truly, they are transient, with the nature to arise and cease, having arisen. They then pass away. They're calming cessation, happiness. So this is the this is the um, the reflection on death. Conditions, truly, they are transient, and with the nature to arise and cease. Having arisen, then they pass away, and in their passing is peace, or in the sense cessation of conditions is peace. Now that's important to to uh, to contemplate that when what is peace anyway? And then this other one, Aji rang wadi yangayo bato wing adi seisa di chuto abeta winya no nida tangwa galingarang. This one is really nice when it says, "Not long, alas, and it will lie this body here upon the earth, rejected." Void of consciousness and useless as a rotten log. <laughs> now, a Catholic priest wouldn't have said that, or dared to say that about my mother's mom. <laughs> but this is a reflection, isn't it? It's, it's bringing into your mind the way it is. Like a body, corpse is, is, is like, a, I mean, who wants it? There's a story about the courtesan that dies. There's, in the scriptures, uh, this famous uh, courtesan, very beautiful woman that that all the men would pay enormous amounts of money to get one night with this with this courtesan. Then she died. Then the Buddha tried to auction off her body. Auction off. Okay. Now, <laughs> now how much are we willing to pay? <laughs> so 
So like a, useless as a rotten log, void of consciousness, rejected. And this, this is a reflection, this isn't a, a condemnation or n- notice what reflection is and, and mindfulness is. It's, uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's bringing, helping you to look at it for what it really is. Not just kind of, kind of make it nice for you, make you feel better, but to bring your attention to, to the way things are. And so the, the, and this is what the Dhamma teachings are for, like the Four Noble Truths and all that. They're, they're, they're teachings pointing at the way things are. They're not, they're not trying to tell you how it is. They're not like descriptions that you memorize and then, then, uh, then the kind of believe in, but they're, they're, they're reflective teachings. They're to be taken and to be contemplated and to be applied to actual experience. So this is, this, death then is interesting to see as a, uh, there's a, there's another verse in the, in the uh, Sutta Nipata called, uh, uh, it goes, there is an island, an island which you cannot go beyond. It is a place of nothingness. It is a place of non-possession and of non-attachment. It is the total end of death and decay, and this is why I call it nibbana. The total end of death and decay, and so in this case, the island is a is a symbol, isn't it? For I mean, because each one of us is is an island, really, and and, and practically speaking, we're we're in the sea of consciousness. This whole each one of us is the is the is a separate entity living our lives alone as a separate entity and then in, in uh, this is just the way it is what it means to be born in a conscious as, as, a, as, a, as a human being in a conscious form each one of us is alone for this lifetime completely alone uh, you are just objects to my consciousness in, in actual speaking you know in, in, in uh, the reality of it that's why when we're always Trying to get hold of people, and uh, to to make us uh, to get rid of our loneliness, it never works. Does it? We 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 use each other to 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 get away from this loneliness. Uh, so we're always looking for somebody to to kind of keep me company. To to I can kind of you know pretend that that there's that it's not that this loneliness is not real. That there's this other person that cares about me and we live our lives together and relieve this, this sense of loneliness. But in uh, reflection, you're actually going to the loneliness. You're, in a, you're, the dukkha is to be understood. You see, there's a very direct teaching. The first noble truth is, 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 a very, is that incredible directness of going right to it rather than dismissing it or analyzing it or explaining it away or trying to avoid it. Uh, Try to create a fantasy world where uh, with, you know, pretty pictures and and images to 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 uh, concentrate on, but you're actually going to the to the loneliness, the death, the 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 way things are, the breath, the body. So death, the total end of death and decay, and this is why I call it nibbana. So this, this is this contemplate your own existence right now. You know, you're, you know, I am at for each one of you. I am an object. I am in your consciousness. Say, if you're looking at me or listening to my voice. But but that's all. I'm a, a, like a perception or a, a sound or something in your consciousness. Yeah, I mean, you, we the conventional realities are the moment. Say, oh yes, Ajahn Sumato, he's the teacher for this retreat, and you've got all the kind of whole biography of me to to kind of to to go along with the conventional world uh, that that we we tend to uh, regard as reality. But it's not real. Life is not like that. When you take it to 
to its ultimate point of each one of us is alone. And so the enlightenment experience is is going to that point and then then it's universal rather than being one lonely person that uh, is, is you know that caught in the in a in a mortal body with these strong feelings and emotions and habits and experiences and memories uh, we're transcending we're we're putting that in the perspective of of conditioned dhammas arising and ceasing and and going to the universal the deathless, in other words. So that, that's why death is the gateway to the deathless. It's not, it's not to like the end of everything, but it's the gateway to the deathless. The, the portal to immortality. This is just for you to contemplate. And don't go around believing this. See, this is a this is a, about a monk, but it's a, they, they're using the monk as a kind of universal archetype for religious seeker. So it says the monk is fascinated by the ultimate. His or her life is geared toward it, and it is the only thing that really counts. But this ultimate has a gate, and this entrance to the ultimate is what concentrates all our efforts and energies. To have the Four Noble Truths ever before our eyes, to constantly recall the caducity of all things, to meditate on death day or day in and day out, to see every event in our lives under the perspective, uh, perspective of death, not to be affected by anything that passes away or has no immediate bearing on the ultimate goal of life or no th- or nothing to do with the gate conducive to that goal to conserve equanimity and serenity in the face of world calamities and social upheavals because they do not belong to the ultimate level to be free and prepared to face ultimate reality there and many similar injunctions are well known uh, features of monkhood. Death and ultimate reality are the facts of human consciousness, but the monk has a psychological relationship to the ultimate and ontologizes the gate. So, I mean, this is, it means like bringing this, this death, this subject of death into, in, in, as, a, as something to contemplate and meditate on and to see in your mind as the ending of conditions. Now, when you, when you uh, contemplate that, like watching, as you as, as say you you have sustained mindfulness, you you be you are aware of the ending of things in your mind, like something you're grasping, and you're you you become somebody that's maybe uh, thinking about something, or worried about something, or angry about something, or obsession with something, and you you go through these different uh, kinds of of, uh, of you know, indulging in these thoughts and then trying to stop them and get rid of them. But no matter how much you try to just follow and analyze and get caught up in, in these thoughts or no matter how hard you try to destroy this and ignore it or repress it, it's, it seems to, to perpetuate itself until you let go of it. And then it ceases. And then it, that's like it dies. That particular condition dies in your mind. It's like it ends. And the and the ending is then peace, isn't it? One feels this this peacefulness. When you really let something go, the result is peace, not kind of blank, void oblivion. Now this is this is what you can test out and what Buddhist meditation is all about really is to is to put these teachings to the test within the mind itself. 
doesn't mean to go and slash your throat, find out whether there's peace afterwards. But to actually, uh, you know, that's not recommended, that's considered <laughs> unskillful. But the, but because one can do it on the psychological level and the ontological So then the, the more and more you you're 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 tuning in or you're getting in touch with the deathless or the that's why the total end of death and decay this island when you realize that uh, now just contemplate your own existence at this moment you're each you're a separate entity aren't you each one of you is a separate individual entity and but you're conscious you can you can be conscious and still be very ignorant, and and you can be crazy. Conscious, insane people are still conscious. But um, so consciousness is 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 the result of birth. Is what so that means we we but in 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 this human state we're in in this human form we we can inform consciousness. We can be mindful. In other words, this is what the Buddhist teachings about the. Dukkha, the arising, the cessation, and the path realizing immortality is, is the, are the Four Noble Truths. And this is informing your conscious experience about the way it is. And it's using not kind of on a kind of theoretical uh, uh, macrocosmic level, but on just the, the ordinariness of, of conscious experience. Like in monastic life, monasticism is is not. Uh, it's a very kind of moderate, uh, non-exciting lifestyle. It's not. It's not climb. It's not kind of doing a kind of daredevil things, climbing the uh, high mountains and and uh, you know coming close to to death-like experiences. We're not. We're not adventurers or, or great kind of. Kind of Warriors who go out in, 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 uh, and seek uh, extreme kind of uh, death-defying experiences, but it's it's isn't it the monastic life based around very just uh, getting up in the morning and putting on your robes, <laughs> chanting in the monotone and and living in, in usually fairly, you know, you know we aren't. We are, we're not encouraged to go and live in dangerous places. So that the a realization then comes not through through courting danger in that, but in in being able to generate that that kind of of intelligent awareness with the ordinariness of life. That's why in in a retreat like this, it's uh, what are you doing here? Sitting. Standing, walking, lying down, eating, breathing. None of it, none of you here are really in, into kind of, you know, being great personality plus types, are you? We're not. Don't give you a chance to to show off and and to to make yourself into somebody, you know, fascinating person. We don't care whether you have a PhD or not, or whether you work in, you know. In a factory, or your president of the United States doesn't. <laughs> we don't care about those things. There's no no importance here, because those things are. Uh, I mean, as far as, as as our social position or our attainments in the worldly life, whether we're we're loaded with money, uh, billionaires, or or just uh, um, on the dole. These are these are not the the uh, issues that we're, we're concerned ourselves with. These might be more interesting in many ways, you know, to, to hear one's political opinions or the story of one's life or the fascinating places one has been or the, the incredible uh, famous people that one might know or the adventures and that of one's life. These, these might be entertaining. But here, on a meditation retreat, we all come here to, to be on, on silence, and we're, we're looking inward. We're conscious then, not of, we're not just being 
uh, kind of stimulated through our consciousness, but using co- our consciousness with wisdom. So the, the Buddhist teachings are wisdom teachings. They're, they're developing wisdom to, to, to develop in you that m- mindfulness, reflectiveness, the way it is. Now the way it is then takes you to realization of peace the total ending of death and decay. This is why I call it Nibbana. Well, you, you can test this out just in the, in, in the little, in, the, in just the ordinariness of your mind. You don't have to be a particularly gifted uh, or highly attained uh, special kind of human being. Just the, the ordinariness is enough. Just the, any condition will do. They're all there. They all rise and cease. But notice that the conditions we, we ground ourselves on are, are the things we don't, we don't, we aren't attached to, uh, in, in terms of our personality, the posture and the breath. I like to use the sound of silence. Is that also just the nothing sound? It is a place of nothingness, you say, this island. The place of, or you could say, no thingness, is the place of non attachment, non possession. So, in, say, when, when there's, you can, when you, when there's awareness, you're, you're aware of maybe possessive desires, or things, and, uh, and, uh, being attached to various things, but, but that which is aware, is the island, isn't it? The awareness is that that is 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 the is where your refuge is is, is is just in that immediate awareness of things, not the not the feeling or the or the attachment or the possessiveness or the or the the, the, the state mental or physical things that you you might be you might regard as yours. So you can, you, you begin to trust more and more in just attentiveness, bear attention, attentiveness, sustaining attention, without having to, 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 uh, make sure that it's yours or to, to analyze it, to criticize it, to make anything out of it, but to, to just be aware and put it in the, in that, uh, that context of impermanence. Noting the ending of when when there's non-attachment, when there's non-self, when there's non-possession. Now you notice when when there's non-self, non-possession, the mind is peaceful and calm. At least mine is. When it's not calm, then it's because there's attachment, there's a sense of self, and uh, and that. And so the uh, and try to get a feeling of, of what it is to be become somebody, become a personality. And when you can begin to objectify it, it's not very nice to be a person. It's it's slightly it's you know at its best it's just it's slightly uncomfortable, like you, you know like ill-fitting shoes and clothes. You know, you just, even at its best, being somebody, being a personality. Uh, and when you see it as an object, I'm, I mean, this I say is for you to, to reflect upon. Being a person is a, a personality, being anything, uh, and, and holding to that identity, will always, there's always this sense of, of being ill at ease with it. So you can begin to note that the sense of being ill at ease, or something not quite right, or something's wrong. Or I mean, and it goes into even I mean, the more stronger, the like more angry or spiteful or horrible you become, then it gets you know it's, um, it's hell because uh, you know one is is just caught into into just being angry and jealous and frightened and and then it's uh, 
the hell realm. Very, it's a very miserable state to be in. But then the reflection on it as an object, just that attentiveness as you, be, as you trust more in just being aware of it, willing to feel it, willing to, to understand it, in the, to stand under it, to, to let it be what it is, to let it be in your consciousness, to be willing to feel it, but not to attach to it, then it ceases. So it's not in, it's not, you can't, you can't do this path just on the theory of the Flora Noble Truth. It doesn't work. You won't be liberated through just believing in the theory or, or just trying to get rid of things that you think are bad. That doesn't work. That's not letting go. It, it's, it's willing to take on whatever it is. Understanding it in the, the, in the insight into the very noble truth is, is standing under it. Like taking it. Feeling it. Feeling the pain. Feeling the misery. Feeling the loneliness. Willing to totally accept this feeling. Without asking for any kind of, for it to go away. Because then we, we also lie to ourselves like that. Okay, I'm going to feel this now and it'll go away. You've got, you've got to be totally honest. It's complete honesty and, and patience. Willing to be completely patient with it. And willing to, to bear the suffering and the pain of life. By doing that, then, you will see the impermanence of it. You realize. Because understanding isn't grasping, is it? Grasping is, in the sense of ubadana, is, is indulging in it. You know, on, on, a, on the ignorant level of, mine, I'm suffering so much, poor me, is indulging in it. Or, I think, oh, can't be bothered with this suffering, get out of here, <laughs> and just trying to get rid of, run away from it, turn away from it, is, is also grasping it. There's two extremes. You're, you're grasping it by indulging and identifying with it, and you're grasping it by trying to get rid of it, and ignore it, and suppress it. But understanding isn't just a, a kind of a, a superficial intellectual trip it's, a, it's, it's like a total willingness There's such examples as Christ on the cross and things like this or religious example in Christian tradition of willingness to suffer you know and, and uh, not, not a kind of morbid desire to suffer like a like a masochist but, <laughs> but willing willing to embrace to take on the suffering of your life Which means that you 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 then are you you you're accepting it you're you're embracing it under standing under it. Then what happens? And go and in this practice, and we we go to the not to the I mean the the uh, in the four foundations of mindfulness. You use the body. The, the, the gayanupasana, the body as an object, was the foundation. You use the, the uh, vedana, feeling, pleasure and pain, or neutral. You use jitta, which is the mood, mental state, and dhamma. Now these four foundations of mindfulness, notice that they're, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, it's not thinking about this, analyzing it. It's, it's going to the actual thing, the state of the mind, the jitta, or the feeling in the body, the pleasure, pain, or neutral of the body, the, the body itself, and then the dhamma, putting it in the, in the perspective of dhamma. Uh, all conditions are impermanent. All dhamma is anatta, non-self.
Let's see, now here's another one. Monasticism, as it were, institutionalizes the presence of death and the reality of the absolute. So you notice that, that like, say, Buddhist monasticism, very much, it's a very strange form, isn't it? The, the shaven head and the, and the robe, the, the brown robe or saffron robe. Institutionalizes the presence of death and the reality of the absolute. Interesting way of putting it, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Now there's four uh, heavenly messengers that Prince Siddhartha saw that that aw- awakened him to where he left his his comfortable life in the palace to mm-hmm. go off and be an ascetic. And these four messengers were the were a sick person an old person, a corpse, and um, a monk sitting under a tree, shaven head, yellow robe. So, I mean, these, now these are four, four uh, signs, the four signs that, that awaken us to our, to our state of, this, this, the state of, of uh, mortality that we are identified with. And it usually, one, one, in one, when you're young, you, you think of, you don't think of being, of, of mortality very much, of death. You, you think of the future of, you know, having, you know, looking forward to, to, uh, pleasure and success and fun and, and all that the, the future offers when you're young. And it, <clears throat> then Siddhartha was about 29 years old when he suddenly awakened to these four. Signs. Now they're quite ordinary, aren't they? I mean, some you know the story goes that the king, his father, forbade him to, to you know any any old person was not allowed in the in the palace, or not, and anybody got sick, they were banned from the court, and uh, not to mention a, a, a corpse would be never allowed inside, or a monk. I mean, the, the, this is like trying to control the environment where none of these things show. This is what many people do these days, isn't it? Let's let's create a a kind of uh, realm, Prince Siddhartha realm, where the, you know everybody looks beautiful, beautiful pictures of men, and women, all looking healthy, happy, um, and uh, and corpses and monks and sickness are totally banned, and, and uh, we we live this life just on the pleasures, the the wonderful food, the the sense pleasures, the delights of of the sense realm. That's what that's what many people are involved with in in doing this in, here in Europe and other places. Uh, just trying to to create this atmosphere that life is just here to enjoy, just a banquet, a pleasure, one wonderful thing after another. And uh, and these four signs then have to be dismissed because once these four signs enter your consciousness, they're it's no longer the same. Once you once you start contemplating old age, sickness, death, it's not the the world is not going to be the same. It's not going to have the same glamour and promise that it had when when these signs were not had had not influenced your consciousness. The monastery is an institution where death is present and the ultimate constantly remembered. It becomes witness to and a sign of the reality of the absolute. Death is the gate, but death kills everything. So the monk is not concerned with anything mortal. Death then simplifies everything. So in in this in the death is is the gate and death kills everything everything is going to die so the monk is not concerned with them with anything mortal and that's why they say the, the ideal monk here or the bhikkhu uh, is 
is, you know, aware of the idea of the four requisites, just the basic necessities for survival. And then the whole aim of the goal is the nib- realization of Nibbāna, the deathless. So that the mind is, is always aimed at the deathless. I mean, the, the goal, when you ordain as a bhikkhu or a silindara, the, the, the aim, the whole, the intention is to realize Nibbāna. It's not to just become, become a monk or a nun or have a position in the world or anything like that. At least it shouldn't be. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's whole thrust and value lies in its, in like the shaven head, the, the robes, the, the arms, with everything, every kind of personal attachment is, is, is kind of, is gotten at in some way. In this life, every, all your attachments, your, to your family, to your position, to your talents, to all these things. It's something this, this life will, will, will keep, keep hacking away at it. Because it's, the aim is, is, is the realization of deathless rather than, than just trying to create a, a false world around the, the, the death bound condition. Because this is a mortal realm we're living in. This is death, a realm. This is a, this isn't life. This is a death realm. <laughs> and I reiterate that because it's, because people don't like to hear that. They, they like to hear this life is wonderful and what happens? Well, you know, you just go on living in a better place. Or, it's, it's, it's kind of like you're not willing to, to really look at it. And because it, 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 the impact of it is important. It's important to be frightened and to be terrified and to, to, uh, to have your, your whole world of illusory world upset and, and attacked. So that something in you will, will come forth in that. Something will, will rally in you. Wisdom will, will, will suddenly be the only thing you're interested in using. Your whole, your whole aim, purpose in life, then is this realization of ultimate reality. When somebody dies, then that we know, it's a, like when your mother dies. That's a, that is a very powerful experience. Because you only have one mother. Nobody else has that same relationship. I mean, you can have kind of surrogate mothers and adopted mothers and stepmothers. Mm-hmm. But it's not the same. Not quite the same. Because it's the, that perception the, the, came out of the womb of that person. That person's dead and all our whole life has been spent assuming that person is alive. And uh, there's so much, I mean, the way one can take for granted one's, one's relationship with one's parents or children, the way we, 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 go, we have so many underlying assumptions and attitudes and relationships with, with family, with relatives can be sometimes the least uh, useful to us because we're oftentimes we learn more from other people, total strangers, than we do from our parents or our children. Because we we tend to get fixed in in roles and attitudes and reactions to each other. It's easy to 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 just. I mean, when I several years ago, I had to. My father was was dying, and I had to go home, and and uh, I had to leave this retreat in the hands of Venerable Amaro, and rushed off right in the middle of the retreat. My mother was was dying, and and so they thought she was anyway, and so I spent the following three weeks. She didn't die at that time, but I spent living with my parents in their little cottage bungalow in uh, San Diego 
It was very, this is one of the most difficult times of monastic life. Because I had not lived with them since I was about 17 years old. And I could see how they, you know, once I started living with them, how their relationship started going back to that. Not intentionally, not intentionally. But it's the force of habit and the underlying assumption, the blindness, and and that of that, that and the way that those those particular things spark off, trigger off certain habit tendencies that one easily falls into. I, mean, I was, you know, way over fifty. My still my mother's little baby. <laughs> I wasn't the abbot of a monastery or anything like that. I'd done some eight hours. The the feeling of the when the mother dies. Not to to make anything out, but just note that that is a it's it's just the way it is, but it's something to accept and under to stand under. Uh, sometimes we 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 tend to not really come to terms with death very well in the Western world, especially. We don't. We don't. We don't know how to. We, we tend to dismiss it. We, you know, we're not want here in Britain, a country like this, is not wanting to to make a scene or make them, you know, everyone uncomfortable by crying or grieving over things. So we, we can put on a good face and people are practice very hard to put on a good face and and to try to act like, you know, I'm it's okay now, I'm quite all right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Where it's it's uh, so because of that the, the so it, it doesn't get resolved very well. Because it's not, not to be just dismissed as a... But it's, it's, a, it's to be seen, it's to be understood to, and willing to feel it. Like I was saying, like to stand under it and feel it. Then you can resolve the... You know, the, the, that uh, perception, the death of one's mother. Resolving it isn't suppressing or dismissing, but it's it's being able to to let go of that, to put it in the more and more in the context of dhamma, to see it in terms of dhamma and where the the personal things are resolved, the personal. Reactions, the emotional reactions, the memories, and the, all this is then resolved in the in the mind. And then it is seen in terms of dhamma. So then, that the result is peace. But don't go around trying to do it to get peaceful. It's, it's willing to bear misery forever. Don't ask for any any shortcuts, any special privileges. Because it's it's something that that will that that when <coughs> when you're ready, it will <coughs> it will happen. You know, sometimes in Buddhism they they tend to talk about nibbana and and uh, it, it, it it's not uh, it's not something that you can to sound like a kind of extinction or a a void of uh, a, a vacuum in the conditioned realm can be seen in terms of 
delusion and and uh, temptation. And with our Jewish and Christian backgrounds, it's easy to 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 uh, kind of read into the Buddhist words Christian and Jewish kind of attitudes, so that uh, Western people who who become Buddhists who or, or study Buddhism from Western mind recognize also that oftentimes many of how our interpretations come from the sin and guilt uh, assumptions of uh, of the Jewish Christian religion and the kind of Puritanism and the the, the kind of uh, ways of So ask yourself if if immortality is here now, what is it? Where is it? And uh, that's the the koan for you. Because it can't be something separate, can it? Logically, you can't think of it as, you know, it's something out there. So it's it's imminent, isn't it? It's imminent, it's now. And mindfulness is the is the path, is the way to that. And the ending of things, letting things go in your mind more and more, as you, as you, as you let go, as you release, you relax, Letting go, relaxation. Uh, you uh, that that peace, that sense of peace, of being at ease. There's nobody when the when there's mindfulness. You're not anybody. You have to be heedless to become somebody. Heedlessness like going in the force of habit, like the, you know, just I'm this way and uh, she's that way, and that's the the convention of of our, our conditioning, uh, it's so easy to 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 believe it, to to get caught into it because it's what we're used to. We're used to being somebody, to being a personality, to and uh, being uh, all kinds of things. And of course, it changes, and we have, we assume that we're the same person all the time. But when you start start looking at at it, watching the process, you realize you're continuously changing. You're not the same person for two two seconds, as far as personality goes, and uh, that's why we 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 like to have perception. Tell me what I am. Go to the psychiatrist, the psychoanalyst, and tell me what I am. Have somebody tell you. Uh, you're a schizophrenic. <laughs> oh. So nice to have have a to have to know what one is, to have it be told what you are, and and this is uh, because we because we don't know who we are, and and what we think we are is is uh, is not what we are. So it, it, it's very confusing. And so the Buddha, in in his way of teaching, said, "Don't try to find out what you are; just realize what you're not." So we think Rupang Anichang, form is not self. Way to Nanita, feeling is not self. Sanya Anicca, perception is not self. Sankara Anicca, thinking is not self. Vinyanang Anichang, consciousness is not self. 
Don't believe it. Investigate it. Find out. If, these, if you can find yourself in anything. Or t- going back to the, the metaphor of the island. You, you, can't, you can't get beyond it. So you can't, you can't be, you can't see yourself, you can't know yourself as an object. So in in mindfulness, then, it's it's being aware before the the consciousness starts getting overwhelmed with the forms and conditions. It's that attentive awareness, watching, listening, alertness. And the reflecting, using your ability to reflect your intuitive mind, and contemplate this, the changingness, the, the emptiness of conditionality, like the, the corpse being just like a rotten log, rather than saying, it's my mother, it's my lover. Suddenly, it's just like a rotten log. It's, it's, uh, when you see a rotten log in the forest, you don't think of it as your mother. And think, things that are rotten, but yet, we can we can feel mother is rotting. The, the, the way the mind will associate that that rather than seeing it as merely it's 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 an empty thing. And the we we might empower it with our emotional reactions to it. But on further reflection, we see it's merely. Just the, the natural state of something that was born now has died and is in the process of decay. And it's and if we if we really understand that, then the result is a sense of being at peace with it, not being repelled or averse. The natural processes are not repulsive; to, they're not depressing. Nature itself, the natural laws, the Dhamma, is not. It's not depressing. Depression comes. What's depressing is is our uh, ignorance, our ego, our our wrong views about everything. That takes us to depression. Death is not depressing, but thinking I'm going to die is depressing. If you you know if you think I I don't want to die. I want to stay young and then. Then we see our reflection in the mirror. Oh, I'm getting old. That's depressing. Having uh, losing our our a million pounds is depressing. But if we if we see if we lose a million pounds and we see it merely as just a perception in the mind arising, ceasing, then it takes us to peace. Everything takes you to to peace. Uh, uh, anyway, do you have any questions on or about this subject or any other uh, uh, questions that you've dying to ask me? Feel free to do so. say that that uh, this is where it's ineffable we have to give up trying to figure it out because uh, this is this is where faith comes in but it's not a faith in in just some what somebody says but it's actually you know trusting because in the form we're in I notice the the uh, we're, 
we're in a mortal form, the only way we can tune into ulti- to deathlessness is is in the mindful moment. More and more, as you as you feel, as you as you steady yourself in that, as you trust in just being that. Then you just see the, you begin to see these things, these conditions as merely the, you know, uh, the changing process. It's not, it, it's, uh, they're, they're, they are what they are, the suchness of them, of their being, but, but they aren't any more than that. Right. It's a it's an attitude of because it's universal. Then you see, like like when I'm mindful and you're mindful, that's one. It's the same. There's one one mind. When we become two, it's when 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 you and I start thinking of ourselves as. I'm Nick and I'm Sumato and things like this, and then, then we uh, start, we become people, separate. That's why in silence is unifying. Silence and mindfulness is, is, is universal. It's, uni- it's, it's unifying. It's where everything merges. And this is what I've noticed in these kind of retreats. It's uh, like these silent retreats where people come from all over the place, don't know each other usually. They usually come, you know, and they don't have much time to sit around and talk in the, before the eight precepts are given. They, and after ten days, there's a strong sense of unity. And hardly anyone, no, we don't even know each other's names. It's because you know one sees a a, a, a oneness uh, or one one intuiting it because we're 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 more and more into you know reaching or realizing that and then we the the differences are are then in perspective of that. Where otherwise, when we're coming here as just personalities and talking and, and, you know, liking and disliking and preferring this one over that one, and, and then it gets all very complicated. And, and if we did that for ten days, <laughs> probably the <be> disharmony. <laughs> A lot of disharmony. What is, you know, to contemplate just liking and disliking things. That mental state. Like I like to just, like, things that I like or dislike. I like to kind of just watch the feeling, the mood of the mind. And the, the perception of I like or I don't like. And it, it's not, it's, it's not very nice feeling to like or dislike things. But even liking things is is uh, makes you. Uh, and it's not it's not very satisfying to like things. If that's what what your main e- emphasis on life is, is to like things or to have what you like. It's going to be very you know it's still going to feel very it's going to be very disappointing because it's it's in, in that transcendence of like and dislike that there's peace. And that's what we all aspire to, really, in this human form. At least that's what I assume. And give anyone the benefit of any doubt I might have. (laughs) 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 They're they're aspiring towards Nibbana. Noble beings, 
That is the uh, like the Arya Sangha of the Sotapanna Sakada Kamyana Kamyana, the four stages. Those are the like the the there's the it's, a, it's a, for each for each day the four pairs there's the the Saka let's say the Sotapanna the realization of the stream and entry. And then then, then there's that they see the, the the way they see the path and then they then they practice and they they realize the fruit so there's two for each one of the four so there's the four pairs the eight kinds so there's what they call maga and pala for each one and the maga is the path so for each stage there's a there's of the of the knowing what to do with a practice and then the then the result of that practice is the fruit or the pala Well, this is pointing to, I mean, this is uh, the Aryan, Arya Sangha, a noble Sangha. And see this, don't, don't go around trying to figure out whether anybody's a Sotapanna or anything, because it, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work like that. It's not, you've got to let go of this kind of attainment mind, because uh, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work in that level. But it's, uh, You know, like the the uh, it's dealing with the ten fetters, and the the, uh, the the first three fetters are are seen through and relinquished by the stream enterer, the sotapanna. So that's the, the, where the the mind is is seen through the the uh, doubting function of the mind, where the mind goes into caught in doubt about practice and the path and Buddhism and teachers and oneself and this and that, that's one reason why in uh, doubting doubt is such an important uh, uh, thing to to uh, understand because it's uh, especially like in, in a country like this where people are so well educated they, then they think a lot. Then their mind will always get caught into doubt. Doubting is one of the biggest sources of suffering for people. Or then there's the self sakayaditi, the self personality view is seen through, and the uh, attachment to forms and conventions as a way of purification or salvation. So these three, those are three fetters that the that once those are relinquished or seen through, when the, that's a stream entry, or you you know the path, you know how to practice. Then you practice, and then the, this is how the Buddha, the pra, pra, the, the Buddha's teaching is: you, you, and then you then you reflect on it, and you see the result. So you know you keep practicing. You have the insight, say, into the path. And then you practice that, and then you see the result of it, which means that that then the, the next two stages, the the uh, sakadakami anakamis, are a lessening of um, greed and uh, hatred, to where those powerful lustful tendencies and in, in anger and hatred diminish, fade out. So the panic can still be lustful and angry and <laughs> but the uh, but the, uh, by the time but but anakami the, then sexual desire is not there because it's seen through I mean it's not not that it's not possible it's just that the conditions for it are one is no longer caught in, in that in the conditions the origin the causes of it. And then uh, for the Arahant is the last, is the fourth one, is then it, the, the uh, fetters of, of uh, conceit, which is not personality view, and uh, the conceit and
an avicca, ignorance, of the, this is like the Four Noble Truths, the, there's one more, <laughs> but the, what is it? Restlessness, yeah. Restlessness. And the, um, and the vicha is, um, is ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. So the Arahant, say, is the, is the, is that ability to see and comprehend the Four Noble Truths. The twelve, and, and this is Theravada in Buddhism, Pali in Buddhism. Then you've got, you've got the four pairs, eight kinds of noble beings. Then you've got the, <laughs> the four noble truths with their three aspects and twelve insights. <laughs> great, great convention. <laughs> You're looking for inspiration, it kind of falls flat, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> all is love, and you know, it goes flying up into space. You know. Four noble trees, three aspects, and twelve insights. <laughs> Sounds like a recipe. <laughs> but but that kind of construction actually is very useful because it. It, well, it's very you know, obviously very well ordered, but also as a as a way of of developing reflections around it. Because I've found, like over the years, just just reflecting on those, like the four noble truths, the three aspects, and the twelve insights. I mean, and the, that is uh, something that that is uh, you know really a useful tool to to use for for your meditation. You know, it's easy to, to keep in your mind. You don't you memorize it very quickly and then then apply that and contemplate things in terms of four noble truths, the three aspects of each truth and the twelve insights. I think like an offering would be like a for more ceremonial like offerings of food and and uh, candles, incense, and flowers and that kind of of uh, you know like alms food, robes. The basic and then gifts would be more maybe more you know like a computer or. <laughs> 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 like Ruki uh, offered, made offering this morning, like the idea of offering alms food and the uh, robes, traditional robes, offering of robes, medicines. Places to live, shelter for the night. Right, and and things like like necessities. And then gifts would be more maybe like books or things that monks and nuns might need or use for you know, like like, like I mean, even a computer is. You know, people offer, uh, give computers as a, as a gift because it helps to 
to do the newsletter. I don't think the monks and nuns particularly want them personally. They probably would like to not have them personally, but but uh, a lot of them, you know, gifts are given to the Sangha for not particularly for the individual monk or nun, but for, you know, to do something for the society or Most of us, when you know, we, you know, the life is is based on just fewness of needs, and so I mean, one really appreciates that how little you need. But we get, but then in in a, in a materialist society like this one, we get a lot of gifts. <laughs> Kind of, you ground yourself with the, kind of very, the basic one, like just the pressure of the feet, mm-hmm. right, left, right, left, and that, and just you know making that as a kind of initial uh, concentration, and then then you can then but then mindfulness is aware of, uh, and you can be mindful of of like walking, but then also you're bringing into your mind the way it is, like like. Like I found it helpful to to just notice what the mood I'm in when I'm doing this, because sometimes you know you you don't feel like doing it when you feel you should. And, you know, if there's any kind of resistance, or just to notice, and uh, or that whether you're feeling kind of confused or distracted or concentrated, just to note, be mindful of it. And and then to but then to to use to, to use the kind of walking the, each step is a kind of focus. Mm-hmm. I contemplate, you know, like like during this hour, I will I will exist between this point and that point, just to to clarify in my consciousness that that for this, you know, to go like a, a resolution to to just be in this particular linear path. For an hour, and then I can see, get you know, feel if I feel like I want to leave it or that. It, I've already kind of established the, the you know, the my intention. Where if I'm, you know, I find if I if, if I don't do that, then I tend to, you know, it's easy to just kind of follow an impulse. But where this helps to check that impulse, the impulsiveness. <laughs> well, that's where where I find with walking, just to, this sense of just the, the anything. The problem is that that any technique becomes uh, becomes obsessive or compulsive. So I mean, it's easy to just get attached to and to the technique and or to an idea about it and what you should be doing. That's where I'm emphasizing this. This tendency to uh, to be to be compulsive about things, like, like you can see, so much suffering is is just around having. I have to do this, or the, this sense of you know I've got to get my samadhi. I've got to do this practice. Just that whole that that kind of tension in the mind. Sometimes is we we that's what we operate from, but we can get behind that tension itself, which will be very, you know, then one finds more joy in just being, walking from this step by step. Because it's not something you have to do anymore. Or you've got to, you know, got to get your samadhi and try to 
concentrate on each step and not let the mind wander and and then you you know you set your mind at it and then and then your mind wanders and then you go oh, can't do it and then it goes on into <coughs> oh you know it becomes difficult and, and despairing sometimes I like the minute just like one step at a time that's all I have to this step Oh, it's so simple, utterly simple. Just this step, next step. Rather than thinking, I've got to practice med- walking meditation. Well, in uh, culturally recognizing in uh, that there's a tremendous fear of, in Thailand that one thing is that the Thais are very frightened of ghosts, and and that uh, going into a charnel ground or graveyard is is terrifying for them, and. Uh, and well, for say, most of us Western monks, we would, we'd love to go into charnel ground. And I mean, it, because we don't, you know, like I've never, I've never been frightened of ghosts. So in my mind, when I'm in a charnel ground, I mean, I'd love to see a ghost, and one of would like to see what they look like. <laughs> but, but uh, I, you know, like in in the forest monastery, uh, the Thai monks, Lung Po Cha, would have to put the Thai monks out in these kutis, out quite far away in the forest, and and that's where the Western monks like to be, far away in little kutis out in the forest alone. Well, oftentimes it's very terrifying for these monks to live alone. In, in a little kuti somewhere out in the forest. And it's culturally, you know, in, you're dealing with a with cultural differences and expectations. Yes, a lot of ghosts in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> Living people are more, much more harmful. <laughs> I'm more frightened of living people. They're the ones that can really harm you. Because they scare you, and they're the, they're the unknown, isn't it? It's, a, it's they represent a whole kind of, you know, the unknown, the, the that which you can't explain. Like a living human being, you can explain. But it goes, and it just pops out of nowhere, and you don't know what it is or what it'll do. Frightening. Ghosts are, you know, and, and they are. I mean, I've felt things, you know, odd things like that. Whether, you know, whether you call it a ghost or what. It's rather frightening, unexplained experiences so I mean it's uh, it's just how you you know what terms you want to describe it but I mean when you're in a culture where very much the the ghost is uh, is very much uh, it's, it starts you know from from babyhood when they talk, told the ghost stories so it's a it's a you know it's pretty it's a it's a common fear it's not just, 
you know, like the village people and Bangkok people have it the same. Yes. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't not met any who've seen English one. There are a lot of ghosts in England, aren't there? Some people do. And Anne Boleyn at Hampton Court. And <laughs> Happy ending. Like samadhi is is used with uh, is some of samadhis are used with with uh, wisdom. So it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, based on intelligence and wisdom. Where the absorptions can be just you know through attachments to, to ignorant through ignorance. So, I mean, people can get powers through absorptions, but uh, evil powers or whatever. But uh, with samadhi, samadhi is always skillful. It's always, it's uh, interesting. The the uh, the root of it is uh, like the D H I D, uh, which is the uh, bodhi or buddhi and samadhi. And uh, the Sanskrit word for jhana, jhana, is d h i or d h y. And that that d h i is means uh, intelligent reflection. So you have samadhi, bodhi, buddhi, jhana. Uh, can, you know, these are all done with skill. And these, are, these are from wisdom and intelligence. Where they say black magic and and all that done out of avicca, out of ignorance. So that that would you can absorb into different energies, different things through grasping them and believing and and. Uh, Fixing them in your consciousness. Mm-hmm. When we're not doing something uh, like we spend a lot of time uh, just waiting or going somewhere, and especially when we live in big cities. There, there is a uh, lot of uh, things uh, to to uh, catch our attention. So, uh, when we are just waiting or, or going somewhere, where do you think um, uh, uh, um, I- is there um, a skillful way to, to preserve our, the, the attention? The, the mindfulness to disintegrate within a few weeks after a retreat. Uh, is it like to should be should we try to to uh, be mindful of the breathing as often as possible or to posture? Or? Well, uh, that's c- to integrate it into daily life is very important. That's why you need to 
to like that, have it like on a retreat like this where it is so kind of special and organized that so you get an, uh, get more confident in say referring to the body or the breath or the silence where you and, and you know see that as something to to develop and to integrate but I mean here you can get more a sustained concentration easier but if you you know you go back to big city and